Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and with each episode, we dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, innovators, all those people at the forefront of medical research. I'm so excited today to bring you my guest, um, a friend that we've been in the same circles and just getting to know each other better, Dr. Mel, uh, Mel Schlotstein. Did I pronounce that right? You're close. Uh, Schottenstein. Yeah. <laughs> Schottenstein. Thank you so much. <laughs> Originally from Cincinnati, she studied women, gender, sexuality, and history of science and medicine at Harvard University for her undergraduate, interested in learning medical skills of meditation to promote cultural competency, competency among healthcare providers. She completed a master's in bioethics at the University of Pennsylvania. She then acquired a naturopathic medical degree at Bastyr University in Washington. While in school, she received additional training in biological medicine under the direct tutelage of Dr. Thomas Rao, who I know and respect deeply. Um, he was chief medical officer at the Paracelsus Clinic in Switzerland, and I've been involved with them too. Um, additionally, she completed training in neurotherapy, biofeedback, homeopathy, naturopathic oncology, which we're going to talk a little bit about today, naturopathic gastroenterology, BHRT, that's bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, bioidentical um, botanical medicine, compounding, environmental medicine, and IV. Oh my goodness, the list goes on. I love it. You are so <laughs> well trained. You clearly, we talked in the beginning about curiosity. You clearly love to learn like me. <laughs> I do. <That's> true. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really think I, I keep having amazing guests like you. And one of the things I see that's common in the ones that really think outside the box are really changing medicine is that curiosity. Because if we kind of graduate from our training and be like, okay, that's all I need to know and go do with the practice. But the truth is, I'm guessing you love to learn for the sake of learning. I do. I love to learn. But the amazing thing is after I learn something, it's almost like you just put it on the universe and then I come right back and there's the person who needs that exact thing that I learned. Um, and it's, it's funny how that just works with fate. It is. And you're so right. I often will have like an article or something I just read. And then I'm like, you know, this person comes in. I'm like, oh, I just yesterday read this study. Yes. And <laughs> that's amazing. Well, I'd love to start. I love starting with guest stories. So you have quite a degree from your undergraduate at Harvard and all those topics that I read and mispronounced <laughs> and then all the other degrees and the naturopathic medical degree. Tell us, how did you, did you always want to be a doctor? How did you get into medicine? Um, actually, no. Um, when I was a child, I was born with a chronic illness. Um, they called it chronic idiopathic pseudo-obstruction and mitochondrial disease, a form of dysautonomia. Um, essentially, none of the doctors could figure out what was going on. My health got worse all throughout my childhood. And then by the time I was a teenager, I was pretty much just given a death sentence by the doctor saying, well, probably won't live past the age 30. All we can do is get you on medications to balance your health. And that's it. And I said, well, that doesn't really make sense to me. I said that if my problem is mitochondrial based and I'm not producing enough mitochondria, why can't we repair the mitochondria and bring more into your system and actually get better from that? I said, it doesn't make sense why I have to be on medications forever and my system will ultimately fail from not being treated. So they said, well, I'm sorry that there really isn't anything like that exists out there. So I said, that doesn't make sense. So, And how started, old were you when you were asking these questions? Uh, 15. I, I got, <laughs> I was one of those kids that said, what really, I think just because I spent so much time in the hospital, um, I really started pushing back on the system, even as a kid. Um, I remember, I still even remember when I was like five years old, I was told, oh, you have to eat these special crackers. And, and I said to them, all right, if I'm to eat them, I have to know why and what it's actually doing. And so I would constantly push back on all the doctors telling them why, why is this important? Why do I have to have this? Why do I need to do this? What's it doing? And we, that's where I'd run into the roadblocks. Um, my, my favorite was, I was seeing this one uh, renowned cardiologist and he says, Mel, he says, you know, it's not really about why. He says, it's more, he says, let's just treat your symptoms. I said, well, that's not fixing the problem. Shouldn't we fix the root of the problem and repair why have the problems versus just, you know, sitting back and just treating symptoms? I said, that doesn't seem like it's solving the problem. He says, well, he says, I think you need to go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist to work through that. And so I said to him, all right. I said, if I'm to go, I said, I want you to give me five studies 
of babies born with psychiatric disorders causing mitochondrial or some type of dysfunction inside their body. And so he's like, what do you mean? And I said to him, well, if I've had this since birth, and it's some sort of dysfunction that's happened because of whatever genes have been turned on. I said, then obviously it's not a psychiatric disorder. I said, this is something that's been manifest inside my genes since I've been a kid um, because of whatever it is that my parents have been exposed to or my system for some reason just was born that way, dysfunctional. And so he says, well, he says, I can't produce those studies. I said, well, and therefore I won't be going. <laughs> Mel, I love this. I love, love, love that you were, you were literally being the function of medicine expert at five years old and on a bit or, or integrative <laughs> personalized saying, I want to know why. And also um, like, let's not just treat like that's amazing insight as such a young person. No wonder you're where you're at. That blows my mind. <laughs> So I, um, so managing, you know, school as a kid and just trying to go to school while being ill and then ultimately graduating, um, I myself was still not optimal to where it was, but I was already on the path of trying to discover for myself where I could start rehabilitating. Because what I started finding out initially is like athletes could I mean, if they were going to have optimal athletic performance, you can build up your mitochondria, you can build up oxygen stores, you can rebuild your cells. So I figured, why couldn't I? So I started doing oxygen therapies and IVs and acupuncture and just a whole variety of treatments and herbs and changed my diet and radically, I mean, I got rid of gluten and dairy and made it highly plant-based and really just tried to promote healthy metabolism and nutrients. And then I just started doing better and better over time. And finally, by the time I was in my 20s, I would say I was already dropped off of 90% of all my medications. And then in, in my 20s, finally, I completely got off of everything. Dr. Mel, I just love hearing your story. I'm so glad we started with that because that's profound. I want to give a picture because I think your story is not so different from the listener out there who's suffering from chronic no. fatigue or any of these, right? What yeah. was it like as five or 10 or in grade school, middle school? What did you suffer day to day? What was like, give us a little snapshot of what your life looked like before. Sure. And then obviously after you've been thriving, give us a before and after <laughs> snapshot. So before was just missing days constantly of school, trying to play catch up. Um, in high school, when we calculate the total number of days I missed, it was literally equivalent to one full school year. Um, so in the end, I did high school, if we're talking about actual attendance, three years um, of actual attendance. I didn't want to graduate behind my class. So I learned to be able to do work and all of that while I was in the hospital, while I was unwell because um, otherwise I was going to get behind. But I did find, unfortunately, there were teachers that just didn't understand. And they would start saying, oh, well, you're using this as an advantage to get ahead. And you're using this as an advantage to take more time on your projects and things like that. And it would just blow my mind that they would think that here I'd be home so sick that I could barely get out of bed because I was so dizzy, blood pressure couldn't be regulated. And they would think I'm I'm not having fun. Yeah, I, I wish, you know, I, I wish I was doing that, but it was, it just amazed me endlessly. It that would happen throughout elementary, middle, high school, all of that. And then finally when I graduated, my health was still not where it needed to be. My parents were still pretty concerned at that point. So my mom actually went away to undergrad with me. And um, so we we were, we were just, our deal was that she would come. I'd go where I wanted to go, um, which was on the East Coast and to Harvard. And But for me to go there, we had to travel back home because my sister was still in high school at that point. So we had to keep traveling back and home. But I felt that was a fair exchange for me to be able to go where I want to go, study what I wanted to study. Um, but I got better during that time. And by the time I got off to, um, to naturopathic medical school, my health was really in such a good place. I didn't need any help at that point and really wasn't missing days for being um, sick anymore. And, and, and actually in one school program that I was at, um, after I graduated, because I originally thought maybe dental school I was going to go to. And in dental school, they, I, I gave them all the information about my health to begin with and said to them, you know, this is the first time I've ever been in a rigorous program like this. I don't know how I'm going to feel. Um, I was given the worst schedule possible at that school. And 
it turned into a disaster going to the ER and all of that because my body couldn't handle the stress yeah. of it. And my parents stepped in and ultimately they said, well, I'm sorry, I think this just means that you're not suited to go to this school. This just means that you obviously don't have a passion for it. Oh. And so I had to actually bring in a lawyer because they were violating the American Disabilities yeah. Act for um, not trying to work with me for this time. But I decided, you know what, that's okay, because I believe in fate. And I believe that if you get presented with an obstacle, it doesn't mean that you have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing that. It means that maybe you need to reevaluate where you are and think about the lesson that you're to learn from this experience and then decide the path that you're to go. And that's what I did. And I thought about it and I realized, you know what, if anything, there's a blessing in this too, because now it just means I need, I'm going into a different path because my passion really is holistic medicine. Uh, again, unbelievable. I just see a couple patterns that I think are worth pointing out. Number one, your family, your mother, that dedication, like so often, um, and granted you had the grit and the will to survive, but that is profound that you had that kind of family support for her to go sure. with you. And Harvard yeah. is no small matter. Let's just point that <laughs> out that you went to Harvard undergraduate and I had a list of the things you studied there. That's amazing. The other thing is the yeah. word I just mentioned. We know from the studies, there's one thing that is most associated with success and that is grit and you yes. have it clearly. Thank you. But what's profound is grit does not come. I know I've been through stuff too and I feel like I have that same passion, mm -hmm. but it doesn't come from an easy life. Mm -hmm. It comes in the terrible, difficult suffering that you went through um, and at different phases in my life, I went through too. And it's only in those times where we find what we're made of and that Absolutely. we really, really overcome these crazy insurmountable obstacles. And then I think it gives us courage because the next time it's like, oh, well, I've done this. Now I can do that next thing that comes and we continue to build our strength yes. and our grit. And I just see that from a, such a young age. And then, like you said, what a beautiful thing that you actually got turned down because you had made a great dentist, but you're, I bet, a much, much better naturopathic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's amazing. Yeah. amazing. I think in the end, we end up where we need to be. Yeah. And I, I really, truly believe that. I think that's whatever it is that we've been exposed to or we, whatever path we're on, it's up to us to take that as a learning experience versus being swallowed up by it. Yeah. And the other yeah. thing we talked before coming on, I said, how did we connect? I can't remember. And we said a mutual patient introduced us and said, Dr. Mel, you've got to be on the podcast. And now <laughs> I know why, because I'm like, oh, we have just such a similar view of life and story and passion and for learning Absolutely. and helping and healing. <laughs> Amazing. So our, our title today of our topic is called Targeting Cancer by Rebalancing the Biological Terrain. Now, the listener might be like, well, cancer, mitochondria, what do they have to do with one another? You and I know there's a deep connection with what you went through and now what you're doing. Do you want to mm -hmm. kind of bring us, like make a connection between those two things and why mitochondria, and then we'll go on to talk about all the other terrain factors, but why that might actually matter to cancer. Absolutely. Well, um, the way I like to describe it to anyone I work with is that Inside our cells, we have like little organs inside our cell. And one of the organs is the mitochondria that's responsible for our energy. And it also is responsible even for genetic information that gets turned on and off. And if we've been exposed to something that's toxic in our environment or um, even something that's part of our occupation that we've been exposed to that's toxic, any of those things can alter some of those genes, activate things, turn them on make the mitochondria sick. Maybe it's not producing ATP in the same manner. Maybe it's um, metabolically, it's altering how we use energy. And so that is really the key area that um, we have to fix. Yeah. So crucial because these mitochondria mm -hmm. people kind of take for granted and you yeah. certainly couldn't because you were have the mitochondria, um, yeah. but they really do affect every single system because every organ contains them. And there are little energy powerhouses. So they absolutely create the currency that allows us to, you know, get up and go and do our things. Um, to breathe to do everything. Yeah, yeah. Like all of the processes. So clearly yeah. you understanding mitochondria rehab, maybe before we go into cancer terrain, let's mm -hmm. just talk briefly because fatigue is so mm -hmm. epidemic for many, many yes. people. And at the core, one of the key components mm -hmm. is mitochondria. You learned how to rehab your mitochondria. Is there a few main kind of key things that you would talk, sure. like take us through an outline of how to rehab the mitochondria? Sure. Um, so I think the most crucial things are be on a super nutrient dense diet. 
That's number one. I try to have people get the most nutrients they can from food. Um, I'm not a lover. I'm taking, you know, a giant handful of supplements because how much are you really going to absorb in the end? Um, so be as diligent as you can with your diet. And so like high plant-based foods, um, try to get the best quality foods that you can because anything that's exposed to a pesticide, unless it's like the dirty dozen, um, you know, the clean, clean versus dirty list, that's really what you want to focus on if you're trying to avoid, you know, paying for organics that is, yeah. but otherwise, um, so diets, oxygenating therapies, um, that was a big thing for me stuff like hyperbaric, ozone, um, any way that you can bring oxygen into the cells, EWATs, that's exercise with oxygen therapy. Um, and even, it doesn't even have to be a lot. Um, for example, EWAT, 15 minutes, three times a week. It's, I mean, it seems so basic, but that is even what Van Arden found for his research was even the bare minimum that you could do to start rehabbing um, metabolism inside the body. And is that just yeah. literally wearing oxygen a few liters while you're doing a walking or workout? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so there's that. There's um, using things that are supportive of the mitochondria in general. Like what are the components that the mitochondria needs to function? So like CoQ10, for example, ribose, carnitine. I mean, those are basic things. And some of those are harder to get from your diet, um, especially if you're not going to eat organ meat. Um, which I agree, I'm, I'm guilty of too. I, I don't need it. Um, but you, if you don't, then you're going to have to find other ways to get it inside your system. So the mitochondria has the basic nutrients to do so. Yeah. Years and years ago, I realized I have a genetic defect in the second complex of the mitochondria and I've been on huh. lifelong high dose B1, B2 and yeah. definitely, and now it's just a, a standard thing. I don't think about it, but I remember there being a big shift in everything about mm -hmm. my health when I really Absolutely. looked at the mitochondria in a detailed way. Yeah. Now think about if you weren't getting those nutrients and then just, just basic nutrients that, you know, we take for granted in our diet and then you weren't getting it in. That's, that's even what I tell people that they're like, well, how is this vitamin even going to make a difference? I'm like, well, let me show you a picture of what happens during metabolism, okay. because think about all those places in metabolism that get blocked the moment you don't have a certain B vitamin or you don't have CoQ10 or um, your NED levels are too low. You know, think about where, where blockages occur. And it's so many places. You can see where the system would just shut down just without having things. Yeah. Gosh, I love that. Is there a certain workup you do for like, say fatigue, because fatigue is kind of the most common thing we get and mm -hmm. it could be multifactorial, but clearly Absolutely. there's often a mitochondrial component. Say you have yeah. a 45 year old woman who walks in with fatigue, where would you start to look at her, um, her testing or her check, check out her mitochondria? Um, actually the very first thing I do is find out about toxic exposures because I find so many people, their problem is they've been exposed to something that has already made the mitochondria dysfunctional. Um, so it could be they are, you know, heavily vaccinated and they've had problems there. Maybe they've been exposed to, um, you know, maybe they cook a lot with Teflon and, or they, and they scotch guard their house all the time. Maybe they work in a chemical company or maybe they garden and they use chemicals while they're gardening and, so the number of people that I see coming in with some type of exposure, even EMF for that matter, um, is going to alter mitochondrial function. And each of those cases, that's I, I try and find out what what is that caused it to go dysfunctional to begin with. Um, and then from there, we might do testing to find out if you're missing certain vitamins, if how you're methylating and, you know, where things are in that realm. But yeah, it's, it's amazing the number of times when it is associated with something that's from our environment. Okay. I love that you're going here because environmental toxic load is my spiel. I think it's so, so we, all of us, right? Like we yeah. really, um, if you're looking and curious and aware, there's no other elephant in the room that's bigger than yeah. the environmental toxic load that we all inhale and breathe and eat mm -hmm. and drink every single day. Um, yes. So what would be some kind of practical day-to-day -day tips? I always feel like people think that they have to go on a 21-day detox and, well, that's mm -hmm. great. The truth is it's just daily inputs that start. Like you said, the kinds yes. of cookware and the kinds of things we put on our body. Do you take people through a, like the basics of like uh, detox yeah. 101? What would that look like for you? It'd be, what are you using for your hair, for your makeup? Um, what kind of soaps do you have in your house? 
um, detergents. What kind of detergents are you using? Um, how often do you eat fish? Um, are you, you know, are you regularly getting vaccines or are you not? Are you, um, what kind of toothbrush or deodorants do you use? Um, you know, it's, it's understanding their daily life. And plus, even when they go to the grocery store, are you eating mostly processed foods? And of the processed foods, are you buying stuff mostly in glass jars or cans? Or are they wrapped in plastic? So it's, um, how, how is their day, what are they doing day to day? Um, because those day-to-day -day things are 99% of the time, the big exposure that the people have. Yes, this is so relevant. I love you that you're saying that because often, like I said, people think they need to go to a big detox clinic or, you know, we yeah. both have familiarity with paracelsis who does aphoresis yes. and all these amazing, amazing therapies sure. that clean the blood. But the truth is like, I always feel, well, I remember Dr. Walter Crinians, who I'm sure you yes. know as well, and he would Absolutely. quote 80% of our envi mm -hmm. environmental toxic load is the air that we breathe. And that was always yeah. a shocker, but it relates to my other favorite topic, which is mold. And I'd love to talk yeah. to you about this because so sure. often- in our air quality, whether it's, I've just realized recently we've had the fires in Arizona where you live and with me in Colorado and that air quality, as I looked at the meter readings, um, those small particulates, so the 2.5 and below, which actually just goes directly into our alveoli, into our bloodstream. It's so small. It doesn't even need transport. So the big particulate, not so toxic, the littler it is, the more mm -hmm. toxic. And all that to say, I tested indoors on the really bad smoke days and it was pretty low because I have a ton of air filters. And then I went mm -hmm. outside and within seconds, it went five to 10 times normal. And yes. I was like, oh, no wonder we're all tired during these fire days. And then I see yeah. people running with the smoke. I'm like, oh, please don't run when you, when the fires are there. Mm -hmm. So how yeah. does the air that we breathe, mold, um, particulate, um, what are some things people can do with air quality? Air quality, have a good filter in your house. Um, that's really one of the biggest things I, I tell people to do is um, if there's any risk for mold, then I have people for sure test it inside their house. Um, but otherwise, yes, definitely gets a really good air filtration system. That is super important. Without that, then you're going to be exposed to this regularly. And I see a ton of people, especially firefighters, yeah, who... Yes they are exposed to a lot of the PFAS chemicals um, with even just the foam that they spray on the fires. So I, I think that's what we breathe is so impactful in terms of what gets into our system. You know, you think about that small barrier of how fast it can go from alveoli into our bloodstream. And then once it gets into our bloodstream, now you have this circulating through our system. And so, you know, imagine chemicals like Teflon just circulating through our blood and, or, you having any type of mold circulating through your blood, any of it's readily. And then you think, well, now that's going to go across the blood brain barrier. Yes. Now all the things that that can cause, um, how it affects the nervous system, how it's affecting the GI system. You know, once it's in the system and it's circulating, that's why these conditions end up being so, so multifactorial and affect so many different systems. And then people are like, well, I have to go to X, Y, and Z specialist because I have all these things going on. But really it's one thing that's causing it it's all about the root. It's, you know, what were you, what were you exposed to? You know, what's the root cause that's causing it? Um, so it's a great synopsis. Um, I'm going to tell a really funny, quick little story. So sure. again, wildfires about a month ago were here were really bad. I measured the particular that was bad. Before I started measuring though, there was one yeah. particular night I got home from work and my typical habit is eat dinner and then I go for a long walk in the evening. I love walking and mm -hmm. I knew the air quality wasn't great, but I'm like, what's a 30 minute walk or 45 minute walk? And I really do. Sure. So I went outside, walked and I was a little tired, went to bed, no big deal. I woke up the next day. I was actually late for work, which is the first time in like 10 years. <laughs> I <Yeah. laughs> And I overslept and I woke up, I felt like I hung over, like, I don't drink, but if I had drank like maybe a bottle or two of wine, that's how I felt. Mm -hmm. and I was like, what in the world? Oh, I am so toxic from, cause like we said, if you think about me as an example, I'm walking out there and then that day I measured in the particulate, like I said, five or 10 times. So I was walking yeah. in this terrible air. It was going directly in my blood. I completely got so toxic, overwhelmed my kidneys, my liver, all of my filtration organs. Mm -hmm. And I woke up feeling so sick. I took yeah. glutathione. I drank a ton of water, electrolytes, mm -hmm. some charcoal. I felt much better yes. in a couple hours, but sure. that showed me. Cause I, I thought, oh, surely like one evening walk. Mm -hmm. Otherwise I'm indoor yeah. 
And it was so profound. I felt mm -hmm. worse than I'd been with a mold exposure that I thought, oh, people mm -hmm. need to know this. And that's just one yeah. thing compared to you mold in your house every day or all these things. Yes. And people, it's like the um, analogy of the frog boiling slowly in the pot, mm -hmm. right? Or yeah. just slowly, slowly. How do you bring awareness? Um, I'm assuming most people who see you <clears throat> are interested and they want to know what you have to say, but are there ever people who are like, oh, it can't be that big a deal? Um, what do you tell them if if you need more buy-in for some of this toxic load? Well, my my favorite actually that that makes me think of um, this one person I saw a couple of weeks ago who said, "Well, Mel, you know, if if I get rid of the vast majority by you know not doing this one thing where he, he was getting exposed to basically just really toxic air," and so I said to him, "It was the place I had mold." Yeah. So I said to him, "All right," I said that. He said, well, isn't a little bit okay, but a lot's the problem? I said, no. I said, it's not about limiting your exposure and keep going back to the same problem and making yourself sick again. I see you're going to keep making yourself sick every single time. I said, what's it doing to your liver? What's it going? What is it doing to your system? He says, okay, I get it. He says, I figured it was, you know, something where I could just have a little and it'd be okay. Like, like the difference of people saying if they have like a food sensitivity that they could have a little bit and then yeah. on, you know, they'll be okay, but you're still causing a reaction in your body. Um, why, why do it? So I have, I, I recommend to people is that if you know where there's a problem, then stay away from it or rectify it. You know, some things, obviously, if you work in that environment, it, it's very hard for you to go ahead and fix that. Um, I've had to write a few notes for people for their office, for their, yes. um, for the owners of the business to actually agree to do testing. And then they found the testing and there was mold in a certain place. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. We'll remediate it. But, but yeah, sometimes it is a little bit of arm twisting um, to do that for owners. And it's just, people need to be vocal. They need to say that, you know, I, I'm unwell. I have these issues going on. I really need to test my work environment and so that I can make it safe for me to be here and you know, be your advocate. So, so important. And I love that we as physicians can actually, you know, be partially the advocate yeah. to say, no, this really, really matters. Because I think maybe yeah. 20 years ago, when I first started medicine, things were a lot less complex. And mm -hmm. if I'm looking at the patterns that I've seen over my 20 years of practice so far, the elephant in the room, as we started off with, is this environmental toxic load is exponentially increasing, yeah. right? I think that's the biggest factor with mm -hmm. now our topic is cancer. Now we haven't even talked a lot about that, but people <laughs> don't realize everything we're talking about has to do with it. So let's pull this Absolutely. into the terrain. Talk about what does that really mean? And again, some of this we've already talked about because everything we've already said has to do with cancer, but can you link it up together for the listeners? Sure. So um, the terrain is like the environment in our body. Mm -hmm. And if the environment in our body is sick, it is going to make our cells sick. And it's going to prevent our body from repairing itself. So the analogy I give to people is that think about a planet. And so like planet Earth, we pollute the planet. We throw plastic in our waters. It affects the animals. Many of the animals have gone to extinction. You know, we are making our planet sick, so to speak. No different than our bodies that are exposed to these same chemicals or the same pollutants. And we are making those cells, the environment, the microenvironment in us unwell. When you make that environment unwell, what are you doing in terms of your genes? Possibly turning things on that shouldn't be turned on, possibly um, changing how your body is able to detox and making the whole environment unwell. So it's creating an environment that cancer wants to thrive in. Um, maybe it's more acidic. Maybe it's not as much oxygen. Maybe the environments, maybe the chemicals themselves are such strong disruptors that it's promoting so much mutation inside your cell that it's causing the cells to actually continue mutating. So I I find that this to be such a huge role um, because well, one, we're all exposed to stuff inside our world, but it depends on how your body is able to handle it. And if it gets overburdened, it's no different than like a barrel of water that just keeps getting full, of more and more water until finally it's overflowing. And it doesn't even matter if you have a hole on the side to drain some of it out, it's way overflowing our body, it's more than our bodies can even handle. So we have to get that under control. That's such a great way yeah. to put it in the buck of the barrel. And I think Dr. Ray, one of your teachers used to talk about that. Like we all can credit yeah. some of the people of shoulders we stand on, but the totally. truth is yeah. 
it's such a great um, way for people to picture for patients that we're talking to, because yeah. it, what I always say is all of a sudden when they come to see me, usually they're drowning in the bucket. Mm -hmm. And while yeah. you and I might test for environmental toxic load, the truth is I don't feel like we have to know every last one. We just have mm -hmm. to bring that water level down with all the totally. yes. things that we know to do. And then all of a sudden when they're here, they have that margin back and the body is so powerful to heal. If we just mm -hmm. give it back a little space, do you yeah. find that to be true? Any comments? Absolutely. Yeah, I don't think it's that we have to get to absolute zero. I think once you even get that 20, 30, 40% back, then people even just feel the difference. Like, wow, I I feel like I have more energy. I just feel overall clear. And even the body is starting to respond better. Now think about like immune suppression that you're getting from a lot of these exposures too. And if the immune system can't recognize cancer and cannot see it, then you're just creating that environment that it's going to thrive in. So if you can just clear just a little bit more and a little bit more out, and the body has the ability to start bumping up the immune system, to start feeling better, the mitochondria is starting to repair themselves, then you're providing an environment for the body to succeed. Yes. So true. It's train, which is your title yes. of our topic here. Exactly. Here. <laughs> so good. Yeah. So say you have a patient who comes in and I'm wondering, cause sometimes like I've definitely treated patients that have cancer, but typically I have them have an oncologist and they do that. And I'm mm -hmm. on the terrain level like you of nutrient yes. support and everything. How, what's your approach to someone? Let's just take a common thing, like a 55 year old with breast cancer, maybe moderately mm -hmm. aggressive, but stage two, um, yeah. what would you start with? And where, what would be your role in that kind of patient's journey? Sure. It's um in that case, it just depends on what their wishes are and also what their body is able to handle. Um, I have people who do a combination of both conventional and treatments with me, some people who do just treatments with me, and um, I have some people who are completely contraindicated from conventional treatments too. And in that case, I work with them where they're at. And first thing is find out their history. Um, what's their dental history? That's a big part of it right there. Do they have root canals? Do they have amalgam fillings in their mouth? Um, are, do we need to be concerned about the mercury exposure from their mouth or even the focal infections from the root canals? And how's that affecting the overall environment in the body? And then from there, I talk with them about day-to-day. Um, -day. What do they use for their regular lifestyle day-to-day? -day? What, um, what do they eat? Are they eating a diet that's very high in carbohydrates? Are they... Um, is it a high plant-rich diet that they're eating? Um, is it a very high meat-based diet? Um, I think that's, I'm not against meat, but I do think that um, sometimes too much can also be a problem too. Um, too much of anything is a problem yeah. for that matter. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, it's all about balance and us finding out where, where things are out of balance and, um, and then finding out the person's occupation because mm -hmm. A lot of times that is a huge indicator of what they've been exposed to or even where the mental health aspect is. Um, stress plays a major role in disrupting the terrain. And if we can't ignore that part too, so that part has to be addressed. Yeah. So interesting. I heard you bring in dental and you yes. clearly, obviously I started in dental school. So I have that <laughs> background and training yeah. and then Dr. Ray at Paracelsus, I know that they yeah. are just big proponents. Um, where did yeah. you learn most? Cause I feel like that is something many naturopathic and, and yeah. physicians like myself miss, but um, it's so critical, right? Like this area is actually yeah. a really important part of the train. What, Absolutely. what led you to like learn about that? Or was it the dental work? Was it the Switz, uh, the Paracelsus clinic or um, definitely um, the work um, that I did over with Dr. Rao and over at the Paracelsus Clinic, that made, um, a, that impacted me a lot, but also it's um, all the years that I've been practicing, almost majority of every single person that I see with cancer has some sort of dental issue. Wow. And it just statistically, if I'm to base it even on all the people I see, it, it's so overwhelming, the number of people that have something related to dental, um, that it's, it just amazes me each time. It wow. still makes me, um, I mean, the root canal, finding the root canal mm -hmm. and then seeing what meridian that even connects with and then seeing how that even relates to the cancer that the person has. Um, that it's, I can't tell you how many times the, the two correlate and it's amazing. Um, many years ago, I had a person come into me and she had a, a tumor, a, it was an oral tumor. And we were talking and ultimately it, it was metastasized to her liver. And, and I said to her, we're starting to talk about dental. And I said, so do you have um, a history of any root canals? And she says, as a matter of fact, yes. And I said, which tooth? 
And it was exactly where the tumor was in her mouth. And so I said, well, I said, we need to take care of this ASAP. I said, clearly that is the root of your problem. And after we got that removed, it was almost like we had expedited the path towards her getting better. It was, it just sped things up so much faster. So, you know, I feel ignoring it is ignoring like a big elephant in terms of um, any toxic exposures people have. So I love that you said that. And I have my own little story too here. And I've said this before, so some of the podcast listeners might have heard me, but I have two molars, the first molars, and they had both root canals and I had breast cancer Ah, 25. And what happened about a decade later, as I'm looking at this, and I was in Switzerland, actually, when we looked at the meridians, they were tracking the same exact meridian and it was breast, which was Uh was colon, which I had Crohn's disease right after breast cancer. And it was pancreas, which I have pancreatic insufficiency. It sure. was literally my health history and these two teeth yeah. that were root canals. The moment mm-hmm. I got it, like I was like, oh, wait, just like you said, um, mm-hmm. this is a big deal. I went and had yeah. them both pulled. Now I have implants of zirconium, no problems. And yeah. what's funny is I was past the cancer and Crohn's side healed for the most part. But the thing that I saw immediate within seven days was I had very severe psoriasis on my scalp. Yes, It just went away. Yeah. That was like a very clear link to the immune system. And it. it's funny because just like you, I was like, oh, wait, this is totally connected. It's like my medical yeah. history in a tooth, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So. I know it's, I get still amazed by it every single yeah. time. And I'll have people sitting in the turn. They'll be like, well, why do we even need to be concerned about this? I said, all right, which tooth do you have it? And yeah. then I'll pull up the map and I'll, we'll just look at it right there together. Go, okay, well, it's this tooth and it's connected with this. I'm like, oh my goodness. And I forgot to tell you, I have blah, blah, blah. Right. <laughs> I'm like, there you go. <laughs> uh-huh. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. The breast and the Crohn's were very clear. And then even the pancreatic and fishing, that was something I just thought I had to deal with because of the Crohn's. But then I saw pancreas. I'm like, oh, that's connected. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. So um, well, as we kind of wrap up in the next five minutes or so, um, what else? I, I think we've really made a case for mitochondria, core energy production in every cell, which has to do with development of cancer and immune system. They need nutrients. They need to avoid toxic load. But then same thing for cancer and development is environmental toxic load is really the elephant in the room, nutrients, all that. One thing we haven't talked about, and I'm curious about your opinion is I feel like even if you go out, you know, grow your own food, or we go to organic sections and buy almost all organic the depletion of nutrients in our soils and the quality yeah. of the food, even organic is diminished. Um, how do, and I feel like that's one reason why we do need to supplement to some extent, but what's your mm-hmm. view on, I think compared to 50 years ago, the kind of even organic kind of locally grown good food is mm-hmm. still more depleted. What yes. do we do about that? And what's your thoughts about that? I agree. It's, it is absolutely a huge problem. And um, I don't know if anywhere here in the U.S. that you could actually buy food that I would say that's going to be nutrient rich. Um, no, it's it's a big problem with how much we have destroyed our soil, um, over farmed it. Um, we have we have absolutely ruined the mineralization of it. And until we revitalize our soil and go back to some of the older methods of farming or even biodynamic farming, which would be obviously the optimal way of doing it, then we're going to be, we're going to continue to have depleted food, but that's going to be, that's the problem of large agriculture too. Yeah. But yeah I, how do you, I'm sorry, please. No, go ahead, please. Yeah. But um, how do you avoid it? Um, that's, that is definitely a big problem. And Yes, definitely. We have to do some type of supplementation with people. I try to keep it as minimal as possible. Um, but for people that are coming in with treatments and they have gut issues, then we'll often bypass the gut with IV therapy um, just to make sure they're actually getting the nutrients in their system. And then after that point, I try to stick with stuff like powders or liquids um, because then the gut doesn't have to break down a capsule um, to utilize the nutrients. Yeah. I love that. And do you offer in your clinic ozone and hyperbaric and some of these other therapies? We do. Amazing. Yeah. And um, we do EBU and yeah, we have hard shell chambers Amazing. and IV therapy. Yeah. Amazing. You're just practicing what you learned <laughs> as your, yes. your, your unofficial education as a child, right? Like I'm, I'm <laughs> amazed because I didn't know your story. 
Um, mm-hmm. And last, last bits of wisdom. It's funny because I just I saw my parents and a friend of our family was diagnosed with colon cancer that was metastatic. She's about mm-hmm. my age. And they said, and they actually wanted just one thing that would help. And I thought, oh gosh, it's not that simple. But say we could take the top three and you and I know it's way more complex than that. But if we had to boil it down to where, where would someone start? They've just been diagnosed with cancer. What kind of bits of advice would you give for the beginning of that journey? Um, first is actually dental. I would actually tell them what's in your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Figure that out. Um, Second is what are you putting on your body and using day to day? And um, third, I would say, uh, what are you eating? Yeah. Those absolutely would be my top three. Brilliant. Yeah. And I love every one of those is not a $20,000 session of 40 hyperbaric, which is a great, right? <laughs> like we, but I love that. And I love talking to patients like, let's start with clean air, clean water, clean food, yeah. because it starts really simply and everybody has access to that. You don't even need you or I <laughs> to start that's with right. things. So yeah. that's awesome. Now, do you have a biological dentist or someone you work with in town that are serious? I do. Yeah. I do. Um, yeah, I actually have, there's a few biological dentists that are here in the city and, um, and definitely, um, there's, there are, there are people that for sure I refer yeah. to regularly. Yeah. I think every doctor should have yeah. a dentist like right Absolutely. next door. Right? So that Absolutely. Because I agree I with you there. I'd, I'd love to have like the same practice. So I can just say, okay, go. I know. Go get next on the- <laughs> get in now. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, um, yeah. Are there cases, last question here, are you the cases of cancer severity or maybe they totally fail conventional where you would send them to out of the country or to another um, location or clinic? Obviously you do a ton, so I don't want to diminish <laughs> Your work, sure. but is there sometimes those levels like at paracelsus? Do you ever send people out of the country for treatment? Um, I have, but actually, I found that most of the people don't want to leave. Um, I've I've found that too. But I've um, but for those that um, can't leave, that do have a very we don't turn anyone away in terms mm-hmm. of the severity. Um, so, like last year, I had a person with a grade four glioblastoma um, that was given two weeks to live, and called me after one week after the diagnosis and said, "Mel." what, what can we do? And I said to her, obviously I, I can't guarantee any outcomes. I said, I really don't know. I said, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, but I said, you know, we'll do the best that we can. We'll remove your exposures. We'll start beefing up your cells, you know, bumping up your immune system. And, uh, she, as every month went by, she kept getting better and better by month five, the tumor already decreased by 25%. She could not, she was contraindicated from every conventional therapy at that point. Um, so it's, I think, don't, I think you, people latch onto diagnoses and the names that are associated with it and the time frames that are given with the diagnoses, but no doctor has a crystal ball. No doctor can give you a real time frame or can, um, tell you where you're going to be in the next five years. None of us can, but what we can do is whatever the severity, whether the person is going to be sent out of the country or stay with us, either of us here in this country, then we we can do what we we can do our best to make your life as your cells and your life overall as optimal as possible and clear out the things that are trying that are resulting in the cancer presenting in the body to begin with. I love that as an ending. Um maybe a year or so ago, I interviewed Dr. Jeffrey Reidegger, who wrote a book about spontaneous healing. He's a medical doctor. And I just loved his work, very similar to what we're talking about, because he was a lot about belief and what we believe if someone tells us we have two weeks, often the patient or two months or whatever, the patient would actually fulfill that because of their deep belief that the doctor knew best. And I love that we take that away, right? Say no, (laughs) anything's possible. And there's a fine line, but I am like you, I believe in miracles. I believe in spontaneous healing. And I believe in the actual Mm -hmm. evidence for personalized precision, functional integration of medicine and the things that you do. So Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen a lot of people outlive what their doctor told them. Yes, absolutely. Love it. Love giving people hope. So if people want to know more, first of all, is your clinic accepting new patients? It is. Um, We're located in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, The clinic is called Mitogenesis Regenerative Medicine. And our website is www.mitogenesis.health. And our main number, which we're happy to talk with you, is um, 480-781-4800. Thank you, Dr. Mel. I'll be sure if you're listening in your car, you can't write this all down. It'll be in the show notes. You can find it um, wherever you listen to the podcast. Um, Dr. Mel, thank you so much. First of all, just your generosity of time and uh, knowledge and 
I'm so sorry that you had to suffer, but by my goodness, it's just amazing to see like how your path in life has just like, that was part of the education. <laughs> Although you probably didn't know it at five, it's amazing <laughs> to see what you've taken and learned. And I love that little girl. I can just see her being like, well, why? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, thank you guys so much for turning into and tuning into another episode of Resiliency Radio. As always, um, you can find the transcripts and everything, the details, the show notes, uh, links to the websites, Dr. Mel's Clinic um, at my website, jillcarnahan.com. You can also find this episode anywhere you listen to podcasts, Spotify or iTunes or YouTube. Uh, please join, subscribe. We can get um, continue to get great guests for you. And thank you again for tuning in today. There'll be a new episode out each week. Take care.